Okay, I'm going to ask you a straightforward question. How much longer are you going to attempt to moderate or stop your drinking all by yourself? You can be honest. I tried it for years and years. I'll get into the why. I think I tried to do that. And I think you might resonate with it. But first, I'm going to help you understand the science around the importance of community and accountability when we are releasing alcohol. It can feel overwhelming. I get it. And for some reason, we still insist on trying to do it ourselves. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about a couple of things. The science between addiction and isolation. The neuroscience of community and support. And I'm going to give you some real-life examples of how that plays out on our own versus being part of a community such as Project 90. Oh, and I've almost forgot to say hello. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. My name is Victoria English, head coach at Alcohol Free Lifestyle. I've been working with James and AFL now for well over three and a half years. And I came into coaching because when I finally, finally released alcohol, I felt like I had found a magic formula. And I knew that there were so many other people struggling silently, just like I had been. And so I teamed up with James and this, these other fantastic members of our team, and we make it our mission to not only help you find the release of alcohol not miserable, but yes, I'm going to say it, fun, empowering, and amazing. So let's get started. The science between addiction and isolation. Let's start with a conversation about addiction and the brain. Alcohol use disorder hijacks the brain's reward system. It hijacks our dopamine pathways. It makes the brain crave alcohol to feel pleasure or relief from stress. This makes it incredibly difficult to stop on your own. And so if you keep telling yourself that you should be able to do this or that willpower should get you out of this mess, I invite you to reconsider. See, we used to have fun before we fell into the grips of alcohol. Remember being a kid and feeling just freedom and joy, doing simple things, playing with your friends, riding your bike, throwing the football, swimming, whatever it was. We know how to feel happy and content. When alcohol is introduced, especially when we're associating it with things like pleasure, relief, escape, our brain learns that, hey, I don't need to make dopamine on my own. I'm going to get a big old hit of it from this drug. 10 times the amount of dopamine is released from alcohol than normal, healthy, non-destructive activities. Kind of like the ones I just described, but maybe in grown-up form. So think back to your own patterns. I can certainly remember mine. You loved certain things, you had hobbies, and you made time for those hobbies. And then over a course of, I don't know, months, maybe years, you found that you were crowding those hobbies out for drinking, or 
you centered these hobbies around alcohol. So yoga may have been really amazing for you. And then you started drinking more. And suddenly the idea of yoga and bubbles or whatever they call it became extra appealing. So you see how without even acknowledging it, being aware of it, we slowly bring alcohol into more and more things. Our brain learns that that is how we have fun. Well, <laughs> if you're listening to the podcast, you've figured out that you've been bamboozled to an extent. Maybe alcohol still feels good in the beginning. Maybe you're at the point where alcohol just helps you feel normal, able to function. And so somewhere along the line, you've said, wait, uh, this isn't so fun. The consequences are growing. I feel gross. I'm not exercising like I used to. I'm not doing other things. So you try to stop. Maybe, maybe you are drinking at home by yourself because you don't trust yourself to drink in social situations anymore. I was kind of like that. I knew better because my personality started to change a lot and I didn't want to be <laughs> out in public like that. So then here comes the isolation part. A couple things can happen. You quit on your own and you avoid anything that involves alcohol. Because alcohol becomes the boogeyman, doesn't it? Can't go there. Nope, can't go watch the game with my friends. Nope, can't do that. Nope, can't go to happy hour. Believe it or not, you guys, I, I go to happy hours and the food is really good. <laughs> I just don't drink the alcohol. And it lasts like an hour or two. I get to decide when I go home. <laughs> I digress. So you're staying home, avoiding things that feel good. Or you say, all right, all right, all right. I'm going to go exercise. I'm going to do the things I used to love, except it doesn't feel amazing. It's not you. It's not you. It's not your fault. Here's the why. Your brain has stopped making healthy amounts of dopamine on its own and it's waiting for its fix. It's waiting for those drinks. So even though you're going through the motions, it may not feel very good. How sustainable is that? How long is it going to be till you just say, you know what? <laughs> I had a stressful week and I exercised and I don't feel any better. So I'm just going to have a drink just tonight. Well, you know how that works out. And so isolating can be a dangerous thing. Let's say you do make it a few weeks without drinking and you actually start to feel better. Your brain is starting to make that dopamine, except then, ouch, you start to experience the emotions you were trying to avoid, like the shame, the guilt, the loneliness. Those are all triggers that can cause you to want to drink again and drink hard. So you see why the science supports not doing this on your own. Let's talk about people who come into P P90. They're feeling all those things. People rarely come into P90 feeling like they're on top of the world. They're in pain. They're frustrated. They're really, really smart, successful people and they're innovative and their, their strategies haven't worked and they're ticked off. They feel ashamed. Like, seriously, I got myself in this position where now I have to pay someone to help me stop. I get it. But here's how it plays out. They realize that they're not alone. They realize that the detox phase and things like that, although challenging, and yes, it can be dangerous. So if you need medical detox, please do that before you join our program or really any program. Uh, 
make sure you're safe. But it's uncomfortable. It is. I remember it. Oof, couldn't sleep, upset stomach, irritable, irritable as heck. But you're not alone because we have evergreen enrollment, meaning there's going to be people who are two weeks ahead of you, two months, three months, and they're going to talk to you about how they went through the same thing. So you don't feel as alone. It makes the burden lighter. You're sharing it. And people are happy to support you. And then you stick around, you start to feel better. And the newer members who come in after you, you find yourself there cheering them on, giving them your tips and tricks. Oh, yeah, you know, I drank this water with these electrolytes that really helped or watermelon. I don't know. It just calmed my stomach. You know, I listened to white noise and it helped me fall, fall asleep. Stuff like that. So that leads us to the neuroscience of community and support. Human connection is a reward. Human beings are hardwired for connection. We need it from the time we're born until the end of our life. So dopamine, the same neurotransmitter that alcohol dumped in your brain to the point that your brain stopped making it, is released during positive social interactions. So imagine that. Imagine that you are talking to these people who really get you. And I don't mean just, you know, oh, you drank too much too. Not that kind of connection. A real connection. Because you have so much in common, right? It might be similar family dynamics. It might be a similar career. Maybe you went to the same university. Maybe your kids are each applying for college. Maybe you're having struggles with your kids. Maybe you're about to have a kid, right? There's so much in common. And so it's like you are with friends and you connect with these people on a deeper level than you might with people in your real life. Not in a bad way. We're not talking about keeping secrets from people in your real life or anything like that. You guys know this, the, the, that feeling of being seen and heard and trusting it. Yeah. I'm like that with my cancer. You know, if I have something going on and I'm six years out from triple negative and I'm so grateful, but I've had situations where I feel something or blood work comes back a little bit mm, sketchy. I'm not going to call just my regular friends about it. I'm going to call my cancer girls. The girls that I met when we were going through this and they get it. I don't have to explain it. I just call and I open up and it feels less burdensome and they do the same for me. So it's like that, you know, it's not weird. We see those support groups all over the place for all sorts of things. And we don't think they're a bad idea, do we? No, we're like, wow, good for them that they have someone to talk to who really gets it. So why is it different with alcohol? We'll get to that. And I get it, it does feel different. But like I said, you're gonna have so much in common with these folks. It's not just talking about the drinking. <laughs> Isn't that nice to hear? In fact, in P90, we don't spend a lot of time talking about our antics when we were drinking because we all kind of get it. You know, we weren't our best selves. What we talk about is what are we doing today to show up as our authentic self, full of integrity, replacing slowly over time the shame with evidence that we are we are good people. 
despite what alcohol tried to tell us to believe about ourselves. Because those behaviors weren't us. It was us under the influence of a drug. And that happens to all sorts of creatures when substances are in their system. The truth is, a, a testament to your character and your integrity is doing something about this alcohol thing. That takes character. And so joining this group, you're already training your brain to start producing the dopamine. It's not going to feel as good as that first drink because it's 10 times the dump. But over time, when you realize, whoa, there's no downside to a steady flow of dopamine, I wake up the next day and I'm proud of myself and I feel good and I've been productive and, and just me. That trains your brain. Hey, let's keep making this dopamine. It feels good. And so the accountability, because you're going to want to drink, I'm going to tell you, you're going to get in this program and alcohol is not just going to say, oh, they're in a program now. We'll leave them alone. No, you're going to have cravings. You're going to have thoughts of it. You're going to try to rationalize it. Maybe, I mean, it's been 40 days. I could probably drink now. It's okay. I get it. I've lived it. I tried it. <laughs> Didn't go well. And you've tried it too. You've tried. But the accountability, because here's the thing. The other members know you and they miss you when you're not around. And you feel the same about them. You want to know what's going on in their day. Oh, you know, Joe, Joe is working on opening that new business. I wonder how it's going. Or, you know, Susan had an issue with her, with her aging parent. I wonder how things are going. I wonder how she's doing or whatever, right? So-and-so has dropped 10 pounds. Holy cow. What are they, what are they doing? Of course, except besides not drinking 630 calories in a bottle of wine, by the way, <laughs> my dietetics degree gave me a lot of information and knowledge. It didn't stop me from drinking those 630 calories though. So anyway, the accountability activates the brain's prefrontal cortex. That's the part of your brain that's responsible for self-control and decision-making. And it can be bolstered by external accountability. When we fall into the cycle of maladaptive drinking, our prefrontal cortex, well, in the act of drinking is turned off, which is why we make poor decisions. But re after enough months and years of drinking maladaptively, our prefrontal cortex shrinks in size. And that's part of the reason, just one of the reasons that when, even when you're not actively drinking in the moment, you feel hmm, a little out of control with your moods and emotions. You're not self-regulating. You're not yet making the best decisions. And so when you know that you're going to check in with this group, when you know that Coach Terry, Coach David, James, and I are looking for you, it, it helps strengthen your, strengthen your self-regulation mechanisms. So in short, you're more likely to follow through with your commitments when you know others are supporting and watching you. That's a good feeling. Because I don't know about you, but when I was drinking, <laughs> people were watching me. Let's see if mom's drinking today. Oof. That was not a good feeling of being watched, but this is a good feeling because you know that we are expecting you and you're expecting your fellow members. That means a lot. That can help a whole lot when we are having those cravings, thinking about giving up. 
good stuff, huh? There's social proof that the power of shared experience helps us get through our struggles. I mentioned the cancer groups, right? Um, that was a big part of my journey when I was diagnosed. It was the first thing I looked for. Oh, good Lord, show me some survivors. Show me women who have gone through this, this monster of a breast cancer. I need to see that. I've got to hear that. I need to, I need to know that it's possible. So social proof is a psychological phenomenon where we believe in something more when we see others successfully achieving it. Can't tell you how many times at two in the morning when I was taking another warm bath for the bone pain from chemo that I would get on my phone and look in those groups and look up the three-year survivors, the five-year survivors, the 15-year survivors, and how it just took me out of my own suffering long enough to catch my breath and get back in there. That's what it's like in Project 90. The, Washington, the university study that we conducted with, the scientific study that we conducted with the University of Washington resulted in a 98% reduction in participants drinking. 98%. They went through the exact same methodology that you will go through in Project 90. The University of Washington was so surprised by our messaging, by our marketing, that they wanted to make sure it was true. They were curious. It's not that they were coming going, there's no way. They were like, whoa, wait, how are you, how are you doing this? And we were thrilled, of course, because we had the data, but wasn't scientifically studied. And so it's proven to work. So not only are you working with a science-based, proven methodology. You are seeing people who came in just like you, and they're going through the first 30, the 60, the 90. Then you meet the people in Beyond 90. They're getting to a year. Then you meet people in the boardroom, which is a new program, that we started for people who are beyond one year. And they're not talking about alcohol. They're talking about crushing life. And let me tell you, they are. If you heard the interview I did with Karen a couple of weeks ago, she's a board room member, tried for years to put alcohol behind her, and now she's teamed up and they have a nonprofit called Awake exposing alcohol, like, wow. So they're crushing life. But those are the people that you get to meet. We just had a guy on last night's call, Scott, drinking a bottle of bourbon a day. He's three years alcohol free. And he came on to visit with the members because he went through this program, paid attention, and built a life deserving of his character, a life that his family deserves. Let's talk about st stigma for a second. I'll say it to you, and maybe you're gonna resonate with this. I didn't want to get help. I wanted to do it on my own because of my ego, period. Because of the stigma around alcohol use disorder. We work with 
very successful, very intelligent, high achieving people. It's okay to have confidence. It's okay to have an ego. When it's in the right context. Are you a business owner? Are you handy in your house? Do you align your ability to do things in your own home with your entrepreneurial spirit? They're separate things, aren't they? So if something breaks in your house, you may make an effort to fix it. But are you going to waste a bunch of time and possibly make things worse? by messing and messing and messing around with it, trying to fix it because you have a point to prove? I doubt it. I really doubt it. Now, you might be annoyed. Darn it, I got to pay money for this. But there's not an emotion attached to it, right? Like, well, wait a minute. I run a successful business. I should be able to fix this electrical problem. Why? Why are you supposed to know that? You're not. So let's apply that to this. If you notice that what I say sounds true to you, let's check ourselves. I, I did it. The truth is, guys, I, I, could, I kept trying to do it on my own, and I kept going back, and it would get worse. Kind of like if I, you know, if you try to fix something in your house and you end up, you know, with a $100 fix and then it, you keep messing with it. Next thing you know, you're at a thousand dollars because you couldn't leave it alone. It's like that, right? But I was ashamed and the ego and the stigma kept me stuck, kept me spiraling farther and farther down. So what if we look at it like that? Have we thought of that? Of that? I don't know how to do a lot of things that you guys know how to do. But as I've said before, the coaches and I know how to help you put alcohol behind you. And you're in that group of shared experience where people understand you. They understand what it is to have a stressful job. They understand what it's like to support others. They understand being the go-to for everyone and everything. They understand being a leader. And so you've got highly trained coaches, a like-minded group, and that is going to help you break down the barriers. That mutual empathy, oh man, I get it, creates a safe spot, space for honesty. Honesty with ourselves, honesty with others. I didn't like having to admit that my ego was getting in the way. I didn't think of myself that way. I thought of myself as disciplined and hardworking and committed. And that wasn't enough to carry me through this alcohol thing. So when I let that go, when I acknowledge my strengths and acknowledge that alcohol is one strong beast. It's highly addictive. Then I, then I released all that stuff and I focused on moving forward. How would it feel to focus on moving forward? Finally done with the back and forth. I have a few more things I want to share with you, but I'm going to save it for the next episode because I've given you a lot to think about. In the next episode, I'm gonna expand on this and I'm gonna share some more science and real life stories from Project 90. And so I hope you'll join me for that. But in the meantime, reflect on what we've gone over today. We talked about the science behind addiction and isolation. We talked about how the brain is hijacked and how it doesn't feel good to try to get it regulating again on our own. We talked about 
the impact of isolation, of being by ourselves in this, and how it amplifies the chances that we're going to return to using alcohol. We talked about the neuroscience of community and support. We talked about how that community activates the reward pathways. Hello, that's what we want. We want to feel better. And we talked about accountability, self-regulation, social proof, and empathy, being part of a shared experience. It's good stuff, guys. Let your ego take a back seat. I encourage you to book your discovery call now. Yep, I'm going to talk about a couple other things in the next episode. But I think this is enough for one episode. But if it resonates, ask yourself, do I need more evidence? Or should I just go ahead and book the call? You'll talk with one of our coaches. It's just a conversation. See if you might be a fit. See if we might fit you. Either way. You're taking action. And as high achieving people, that's what you're about. I can, I know that part for sure. Maybe not as much lately. Maybe alcohol's making you sluggish, not as productive. But you know yourself. You are an action taker. And so take action. Until next time, take good care and have a great day. <laughs>